Hi everyone, great to be here. So today, this talk is going to cover what is accessibility, why it is important, and what we did to make our game sort of accessible to those with disabilities. So first, a quick introduction. My name is Connor Bradley. I am founder and director of Softleaf Studios. We as a team strive to make disability-friendly game experiences um, because for the large part, games are not made accessible to those with disabilities. So being big gamers ourselves, the idea that there are players that are not able to enjoy these kinds of experiences is a real shame. So we've been working with people who are blind, deaf, and those with other physical and mental disabilities to try to remove barriers from games and sort of to push the boundaries of sort of what's possible with them. Currently, we're working on an accessible point-and-click adventure called Stories of Blossom. And to see the, the joy and the excitement that we've received from these kinds of communities uh, really, really uh, is, it's, just, it's heartwarming to sort of see the excitement there and that the fact that they can sort of play these kinds of experiences without having to think about their disabilities, which really is what it's all about. So hopefully this talk will spark some inspiration in each of you to sort of look into the topic more that aren't familiar and sort of then bring it into your own work. So what is accessibility? Before that, I'll go into some quick definitions. So when someone comes across some form of barrier that prevents them from performing a task, this is what disability is. So to give an example, the common example is stairs leading into a building. For someone who is in a wheelchair, the stairs are the barrier that are preventing them from moving forward. In games, this can be as simple as text being too small to read or not high enough contrast. It can be complex control systems and lack of audio feedback for players who need that other bit of context. But when a designer goes and removes those barriers or works around them, that's what accessibility is. So to use our previous examples, installing a ramp into a building, we're not removing the stairs, but we're providing those options so if someone who can't access the building through that, they're able to use that. And it's the same approach in games as well, so making sure that there is options to increase text size for players who need that, simplifying the control schemes and providing audio feedback. And for those that maybe are asking why this is important, according to Xbox, there are 429 million gamers who identify as being disabled, and 15% of the world's population is in some form disabled. And these figures don't include people who are colorblind or those with a lower reading age. On top of that, then, there is also your temporary and environmental disabilities. So for example, if you've sprained your wrist temporarily or there's very noisy roadworks happening outside, all these situations can benefit from accessibility in games. And It's important to realize that developers aren't intentionally putting these barriers in games, it's just that they're maybe not aware that there is steps that be, can be taken to make a game more accessible. And games are not just a form of entertainment, they can be used as a way to socialize and share and come to events like this. 
and socialize. And for some, that is the only outlet that they can do that. So that's why it is so important to be thinking about these kinds of things. So the, talk, the, the, the title of this talk was The Show to Share Our Journey of Making Our Game Accessible. It's been a, a long, long road with some, some highs and some lows. So, so I'm going to share those. We started with the goal of making a point and click game with, which had as few barriers as possible from the very beginning. So while we were concepting art, we were also designing our accessibility. And Claire and I not being rel relatively new to the, the world of accessibility, we uh, had a lot of learning to do, but at the same time, it was a, a great chance to, to learn. Our first attempt was very much like the wild coyote running off a cliff. Uh, we sort of tried to do too much in the beginning. We sort of, we were trying to make a game that is, was accessible to everyone. And this kind of thing takes a lot of, lot of work. So in hindsight, we were trying to make it accessible to all of our testers that we had. Another thing that we were probably not the best approach was to look at accessibility guidelines as options to implement. And really, that's not quite the, the approach to tech. So we had separated our testers into different groups. So we had our sight, hearing, motor, and cognitive. And in the beginning, we sort of brought them all in at once. And since we were quite a small team, we were focusing on the biggest barriers in the games. For example, someone who was blind and needed to be able to navigate the game. It did lead to other groups who maybe we weren't focusing on as much due to that lack of time. There was some confusion and frustration with some barriers in the game. But it wasn't all bad. And with the work that we had done, someone who had no sight whatsoever was able to navigate our game and its, its menus, solve the puzzles, and really enjoy the, the game's narrative. There was still a lot of work to do, of course, but these kinds of, of tests sort of helped us identify what we needed to look at and what was sort of the biggest barriers for players. For example, even though the players who were blind could play the game, it was, there was some complex, complexity in the text-to-speech systems and the overall design of menus that were sort of needed to be looked at. And around this time, we sort of went with the approach of doing audio descriptions for a game. So what we did, as I was saying, we looked at our game, what barriers there was, there were, and seen what we could do to remove them. Games being very visual, uh, it's sort of a no-brainer to think, okay, well, a player who is blind is missing a on a lot of that sort of visual um, hints in the, in the game's visuals and the overall charm. So this is something that we sort of went to approach. But as much of a no-brainer as it was to us, we and the community could not find a game that had done audio descriptions, which was a strange, a strange thing for us. So what we did was we went and looked at films and TV to see what has been done for audio descriptions. So this is an area that we're really proud with the game. We're sort of one of the, the firsts to, to have that. 
And those that are not familiar with audio descriptions, the idea is it's a bit of dialogue that describes maybe a character's ex um, appearance and sort of um, expressions, the overall tone of the, the environments, and sort of any events that are happening during the gameplay. And around this point, we sort of had our testers who we had in the beginning come back and test with the audio descriptions, and they were blown away with how much they were actually missing out on. And because there's only so much that you can get through just normal sound design and dialogue. There's a lot of, as I say, the, the charm and such that they're missing out on, and sometimes there's a lot of humor that's put into your artwork or um, to set the tone, so if it's more of a horror kind of game, there's a lot of that kind of tonality that gets lost. And it was around this time then that we knew that as a studio, this is what we were going to be focusing on, is how we can make games more accessible. And to see the joy that players can just pick up a game and not have to worry about uh, barriers being there, they can just enjoy it like everyone else. And what, the more that we can do as a studio to sort of help that, the better. So that's why it's great to be at events like this speaking about it and sort of raising awareness that there is still quite a lot of work to do in the industry um, and it's really just down to raising awareness to it and then looking at the steps that we can take. From there then we started working with our other groups and one of the features that we added was sort of heavy customization of subtitles. So things like being able to add speaker names and speaker intonation, because if someone cannot hear the dialogue, they're sort of missing out again on a lot of that context. So is the player whispering? Are they excited? Or in this case, are they begging? Um, all of that kind of stuff really helps uh, the player get immersed in the narrative. Top of that then, next group, we were adding in goal trackers and narrative recaps. And very common in point and click games is sort of having hint systems. And these are really crucial for players who maybe are, because difficulty is very subjective. A puzzle which is extremely easy for one person can be extremely hard for another. So it's, it's crucial to have these kind of things in your games to stop that frustration. So what we do is we slowly give hints which are gradually closer to the solution. And if they still can't solve it, we also provide that solution to them. To give an example, a player who is autistic may not be able to put two and two quite together the same way as others. So it's sort of giving those hints in dialogue, in the visuals, in goal trackers and um, hint systems. For those interested in sort of reading about all the different accessibility features that we have in the game, we have all of them listed at our website, softleafstudios.com. This talk would be a lot longer if I was to go through each one of them individually. So yeah, definitely check that out if you're interested. But I'll sort of go over sort of the ones that we've seen had the, the most impact to our players. As, as previously said, the audio descriptions were a huge impact. But another one, point and click games, the clues in the title, you sort of are pointing and clicking, but not everyone can do that. So this, when we first started, was a big barrier that we were trying to address. And the way that we've done that is 
have a tab system, so you can tab through each hotspot that's in the game. And this works great with text-to-speech. So if a player is blind, they get that information, so it reads the label. Um, so in this example, it would be an overgrown bush. So that gives them context of what they're highlighting, and then they can click on that, and then the character will walk. So there's a lot less manual work that uh, needs to, to be put into that. And the great thing about this system as well, it also offered uh, the ability to play the game, the entire game with just two buttons, no analog um, input required at all. And for our motor group, this um, really, really was great benefit. But of course, we still offer other players the ability to point and click if they want, but the, the whole idea here is that we're offering these options for players who that isn't a possibility. Um, we've also different shortcuts and such to quicken that process. But one thing that's really important is the ability to remap controls in games as well, because not everyone can use a mouse or not everyone can use a keyboard. So it's, it's sort of having that option that they can change it to their preference. And one thing that is sort of in a lot of these kind of genres is having to hold down a button and then drag an item uh, to use it. I believe this is sort of unneeded complexity. Uh, really, uh, long games are doing it nowadays is they just click it and then you drag uh, and use the item. because not everyone can hold down a button, let alone holding it down and then move the, the cursor or analog stick. So it's important to keep those kind of things in mind. So to somewhat conclude sort of all of what I've said there, uh, games do have barriers and our goal as developers is to try to remove as much of them as possible but sort of start the, the process really early. So it's a lot harder to start looking into this when the whole narrative is written and voice acted and localized. Sort of once you get to that point, it's harder to go about rewriting stuff and a lot more expensive. So that sort of also gives you the chance to then go forward and have testers in and see what areas that are causing confusion or frustration. One thing that we did was have all of our narrative try to be as simple and concise as, as we could. And it's not about, it doesn't mean that you can't go about making a game that has like huge lore and such. It's just make sure it's easily digestible and easy to uh, to understand. And our game truly wouldn't be where we got to without the help of the disabled community. Uh, they have been crucial to sort of removing these barriers and can't thank them enough for that. So where we're at sort of with, with our game We've been sort of highlighted from for the work that we've done. Uh, more, most recently, Xbox has showcased us in their accessibility spotlight. And we're now starting consultancy with other developers to try and uh, give advice on their games, what they can be doing to sort of uh, broaden their, their audiences out. And now is really an exciting time to be in accessibility. Uh, a small company like us, really there is just the two of us, and to be sort of, we're being put up with AAA games and such for the work that we're doing. So it's, any work that anyone can do, as small as it is, will allow more players to play your game.
And lastly, Stories Blossom is on Steam. And uh, definitely check out the events that is currently on there. A lot of great games. And but do, I'll be around all week, so if you have any questions about accessibility or just want to talk in general, I'll be here and do, uh, do feel free to come around. That's me. Thank you. Yeah, if there's time for it. Can see a hand right at the back. Hello. Uh, you mentioned uh, audio description for the game. Uh, the company you used was it was it a company that specialises in audio description for games? So we actually did it ourselves. Uh, we looked at other companies that did it for films and and uh, theater and show. TV and YouTube and yeah. everything else. So we just looked at that approach and then since we wrote the narrative ourselves, that sort of made it, we knew sort of the game inside and out, so we were able to describe what was important and sort of the pacing of it. Um, but definitely, I know that there are companies that are looking at it currently doing for their trailers for their games and there's some great work that um, there is audio de description uh, companies that are helping out with that. So it's, it's really, uh, you can go either route really. What worked for us was yeah, just doing it all in-house. And did Thank you me. get an audio describer to write the captions for you or did you run it past an audio, somebody who is an audio describer to make sure that it was kind of in line with, because it's got a, quite a style audio description. So the way that we did it was, so we wrote um, each, so to give an example, we had sort of describing our characters, so um, then that was voiced by Claire, and that then plays between each of the dialogue. Um, we do have audio captions as well, which is more for sound effects and um, little bits of audio that for players who are deaf or hard of hearing, they sort of give that context as well. The audio descriptions are more for players who are, um, they don't have any sight, or players who maybe struggle with context, so more in the cognitive group, sort of they need that additional bit of information to sort of help them uh, get that context, if that answers that. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you very much. We, perhaps we have time for one more. Okay. Um, I don't think I can get there. Can you pass this microphone down the line? Hi. Um, when it comes to sound effect uh, audio descriptions, or especially descriptions of like coughs and laughs and giggles and things that are midline, what did you find was uh, the most effective way to communicate those? Was it like laugh? Laughing, ha ha ha, mm -hmm. you know, how did that work? Yeah, so that's, we um, added those to the sort of speaker intonations. So say if someone was whispering or giggling, that would sort of be in brackets before their name or after the name, their name, sort of, sorry. And then the dialogue would follow. But if it was sort of mid line, we would then put in, uh, in brackets Similar to um, how like BBC is a great resource on all the recommendations for subtitles, and there's one there for audio caption sort of different sort of squeaks and coughs and laughter and just all those kind of things. So really, it's just making sure that you've wrote it in a way that um, is easy for players to understand, but especially if the subtitles only are there for maybe a couple of seconds. Um, like a lot of games, we have made sure that that works for our game, but for example, if players need more time to read, they have that option to then uh, progress at their own rate, which I think is quite important as well. 
And when it was a, a sound effect that wasn't, wasn't as part of a dialogue uh, line, again, did you use sort of onomatopoeia, or was it more useful to say explosion as opposed to boom? Yeah, so we sort of were quite creative with that. So, so if there was like something as simple as, um, in our game, we have a, a character who's digging in dirt, for example, and there's some uh, Foley sounds there. So we have audio captions that sort of come up similar to the dialogue. They just go up and they say, dirt rustle, or something like that description. But then there's other chances where we have a wee character who is this wee wispy creature that sort of runs and sort of is uh, hemming to himself, sort of like catch me if you can kind of thing. So we've added just that in text uh, in the caption, just saying, um, singing catch me if you can melody. So, and we really found that players who were from these communities that benefited from them, that made them laugh, just being able to see that. So that's so important. Right on, thank you. Thank you. And I think that's our time. Please join me in saying thank you to Connor.